Thank you all for tuning in. I imagine you heard about this from my email list. Maybe you're a YouTube subscriber. Either way, thank you for being here. If you don't know me, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Jake Dester. I am a saxophonist, musician, composer, performer, music producer. I'm currently based in New York City. And I've been playing saxophone for over 20 years now and playing jazz and improvising most of that time. I studied music at the University of North Texas and was there for about six years studying jazz saxophone, composition, arranging, and music theory, and had the opportunity to be there during the transition between um, Jim Riggs, it's a great saxophone player and instructor, uh, famously for playing in the Dallas uh, Symphony Orchestra, played with them quite a bit, also played with a lot of high profile people in their bands, including Frank Sinatra and Brad Lely, who was the lead alto and music director for Harry Connick Jr. Those were like the big saxophone teachers there when I was there. Um, also studied quite a bit of jazz arranging, composition, music theory, and since then, I've been playing, teaching, working in some capacity as a saxophonist, musician, and have worked with students from ages, I guess, like sixth grade, whatever that is. And I think the oldest student I've worked with is 76. So I've got a lot of experience, a lot of time playing saxophone, and I just want to be able to put myself out there, share my thoughts on jazz saxophone playing and techniques, and I felt like this would be a cool thing to try. So thank you all for tuning in. I sent an email out to my list, and if you are on my list, thank you. There's about, I think, 800 people on the list so far. I would like to increase that number and send you more and better information. And I sent an email asking if I was going to do a live stream, what would you want to hear? What would you want me to talk about? And I got a lot of really good responses. So I'm going to talk about, in order of, uh, you know, that I received them, kind of some random topics. My friend Eric gave me some suggestions. He was talking about mouthpiece types, classical versus jazz. I personally am not really a gearhead. I've been using the same mouthpiece on my alto since, Lord, like 2008 or something. This is a Meyer hard rubber 7M, uh, seven tip opening medium chamber. I will say the distinction between a jazz mouthpiece and a classical mouthpiece usually is that a jazz mouthpiece has a circular chamber. A classical mouthpiece often has like a more rectangular chamber. And if you're going to be playing in a wind symphony or something like that, I definitely think that a classical mouthpiece is ideal. You can get a more convincing tone, true to like the French school of classical saxophone playing, which is a little different. Actually, it's incredibly different than jazz, I would say. And um, as far as material, I find... I like hard rubber better. I've played on metal mouthpieces. I've tried them. I'm not a huge fan, although they're great if you need to project. You're in a setting where you're playing with like a bunch of electric instruments and you've got to cut through. Or if you're playing lead in a really loud band, good for that too. Good for like pop, good for rock. I would prefer to use a rubber mouthpiece and just mic it. That's my preference. And uh, I'm... You know, I'm like I said, I'm not a big gearhead, but I will tell you about my setup, which I've kind of settled on. I have, like I said, a Meyer medium chamber, seven tip opening. I play on a Legere synthetic reed. For the longest time, I played on cane reeds. And about four or five years ago, a friend of mine named Dr. Kyle Hutchins, who teaches at the, uh, where is it, Virginia Tech said, you know, if you're playing outside, inside, different geography, different altitude, you're going to want consistency in your read. 
So I personally, I think that the getting some messages here. What's up, Eric? What's up, Moritz? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. All the way from Germany. I play on a synthetic read because I think that having consistency with the read for me is more important than having, you know, that that slight, slight more richness that you get from a cane read. And also I, you know, as much as I love like the art of like finishing reads and sanding and all that stuff, like I do enjoy it, but it's not something that I want to be doing all the time, especially here in New York. I might be playing inside. I might be playing outside. I might be playing underground and uh, with humidity the way that it is here. It's just, I, I mean, I strongly recommend trying the Legere reads. I think it's, it's better if you want to eliminate things that might go wrong. So that's my take on reads. Ligature, I've been using the same ligature forever. It is a Rico Oleg, Olegature. I don't even know what else is out there at this point. I know people have come up with all kinds of crazy devices holding the reed to the mouthpiece. But this is what I've settled on. I like it. It helps me get the tone that I like. And um, yeah, I'm, you know, it, that's the basic gist of it. I think if you find something that works for you to help you get a sound, uh, try to cultivate that sound through long tones, overtones, you'll find what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And a lot of it is just, it's physical. It's almost like a shoe. So if you have, you know, a size nine foot and you're trying to wear a size seven shoe, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to get what you need out of it. So my take on it is find a good tip opening, find a read that you like and stick with it. And if it's still not getting the job done after you know, getting some good time playing overtones, long tones over a consistent amount of time, try changing it, but don't change drastically. You know, if you like the sound of something, maybe try like just the next tip, tip opening up or the next tip opening down. Anyway, I'm not going to talk more on it because I've, there's tons of videos out there about saxophone mouthpieces and setup. And I would like to get through all these topics. I have several things that I want to discuss. And so I will move on. The next one is reeds, which I kind of touched on. Like I said, I feel like cane is great, but it takes a lot of work. Uh, I definitely recommend the Legere reeds. I'd try them. I'm not getting paid to say that. They are great and they are consistent, which I love. Um, the next topic, also from Eric, talking about vibrato. I'm going to do a little demonstration here. Uh, do you modify? Okay, real quick. I'm going to address this. Moritz, do you modify the Leger reeds? <clears throat> no, I don't. I, and I don't know if it's really wise or really practical to do that because they don't, you can't really sand plastic and cut plastic the same way you can cut the fibers of a reed. I wouldn't really recommend it. And they have a pretty big variety of the kinds of reeds that you can get. They have like the American cut, the signature. There's um, one, I think it's more geared toward jazz. I'm using the American cut is what I'm doing. And it seems to get more of a, you know, for me, like I kind of like to have more of an authentic bebop kind of sound. And it seems to be able to do that quite well. I used to play on the signature Legere reeds, and they were a little too classically. I would compare them to like a Van Doren Blue Box. These are more like the, to me, they feel like a Java Red kind of reed. The, that's the filed uh, Javas. And that's what I liked the most when I played on cane reeds. So I would recommend trying the American cut. One of my students said he tried it and he found it to be too bright. It's kind of expensive. So I, I think they're like $30, $40 for one. Keep that in mind. Uh, if you want to buy one, try one, I would look up because there are comparison charts that they have. 
So you can look up like, okay, how does this, mine's a 3.75. How does a 3.75 synthetic read compare to a Van Doren Java? Or how does it compare to a Rigotti? Or how does it compare to a Rico? It is an investment. I think it's worth it for me to have a synthetic read. Sometimes I miss playing on cane reads. I miss the craft of it, but it is it is great. I don't think that they're something you should try to work on. Uh, what's the instrument? Oh, hey, Nayland, hello. Uh, Christoph Brugge, it's an E-flat alto saxophone. That's funny. This, okay, the story behind this horn is really interesting. I had gone through a period where I was like, I kind of didn't want to play saxophone and I wanted to focus solely on songwriting and production. So I, it's kind of like an identity transition. I ended up selling all of my instruments and practically everything I owned. It's a long story why, but I came to New York City. I had no instrument at all. And I really didn't intend to get back into jazz playing super heavy but I started hearing ideas that I wanted to try to work out. This horn is actually a student model horn. It's not, a, it's not a pro horn. I'll just be straight up about that. I bought this horn for $50 at a used bicycle shop. And part of the reason why I still play it is that well, first of all, I play in public a lot. I play in the subway a lot. I don't want to bring a, a vintage or designer luxury pro horn, whatever you want to call it, into public settings so much. But part of why I play it is because I want to prove, and I am proving, that you don't need a super fancy horn to get the ideas out. Most of the time, most situations that you're in playing saxophone, you aren't going to need a $10,000 instrument. And you really aren't even going to need like a $4,000 instrument, which I think is the price point for a lot of the pro horns now. This instrument, like I said, it was $50. Um, a good friend of mine and someone I went to school with at UNT, John Ledbetter, whose work is amazing and he makes super awesome horns. He has a shop here in New York and he's kind of got it playing the best that it can play for what it is. And I don't really feel like I need anything else. I can play pretty much every tempo, every style that I need to. Um, there is something super hip about uh, more upscale horns, but it's kind of like, it's like if you are driving a car, right? And you're driving on regular roads. Like if you're driving, I can see if you're like driving on the Audubon or you're a street racer or something, you might want a Ferrari or you might just think it's cool. Like if you've got the cash or if you can afford it, sick, dude. Like if I had, if I was going to be able to like drop like 14K on a horn, I might, you know, but like, I don't know if it's really my personality. What I would say, like, one of those luxury horns is like a luxury car in a certain way. 99% of the time, there isn't a need to drive a Maserati. Like, a Toyota Camry is going to get you there. It might not be the coolest thing, but, like, what are you trying to prove? And a lot of the time, if I'm at sessions in New York, it's kind of funny. Like, there will be kids who have really expensive horns, and it's like... They don't, they're not connected to it. Like, so I see it a lot firsthand where, yeah, you have like a $12,000 Selmer Mark VI, but that doesn't make you a good player. It makes you the owner of a great saxophone. But what does that really, you know, what does that really do? Does that make you better at connecting with an audience? Does that make you better at hearing changes? Like, I don't know. The, the, it's not my priority. So to answer your question, this instrument is branded as a Vito, which I don't know if you can see. Um, it is, uh, I think it's from like the 1970s. 
and it's called Vito, and it was made by a brand called LeBlanc, which actually is just a cover for Yamaha. And Yamaha gave itself that name during that time period because a lot of World War II veterans were buying instruments for their kids who were taking band in school. And obviously, if you were fighting in World War II, you would have had you would have felt a kind of way about uh, Japanese products. And at that time, I think a lot of the stereotype was Japanese products were pretty bad. But this horn, honestly, I used to play on a Selmer, and it's funny, like this horn plays better in tune than my old Selmer that I paid thousands of dollars for. So anyway, okay, this is the next thing is, is vibrato. These are kind of random topics, but that's what I signed up for, vibrato. In jazz, there's a very specific kind of vibrato. There's a few different ways that players use or do not use vibrato. If you're listening to old school jazz music, like early big band music, if you check out like um, Duke Ellington stuff or even further back, you know, like Cab Calloway or some of that, like Dixie stuff, it is a lot of the time you're using vibrato a lot. So like, let's see, I can use like the same tune, right? <laughs> Like that's the theme for body and soul, right? You could, if you're playing a very old style, you want to put kind of a wide vibrato on things. That's just the vibe. And I highly recommend checking out those records. It didn't really make it into modern saxophone style though. And so it, it has a very old school kind of outdated vibe. If you're coming at every note, and there's something hip about it. I mean, there are players that do it extremely well. I'm not really one of them, but if you check out like Benny Carter's discography, you check out uh, Ben Webster's discography, Johnny Hodges was able to use that technique really tastefully, but it's mostly players that come from that like swing era and before who really crushed that style. Personally, it's not my vibe. And I think that is because I really, my, my favorite players are like the bebop players, Charlie Parker, Cannonball Adderley, Sonny Stitt, and then more modern players beyond that kind of pushing into like the sixties and, you know, Train, Wayne Shorter, Jackie McLean, Hard Bob Katz, Hank Mobley, none of them, Dexter Gordon, none of them are really using that kind of vibrato unless it's kind of a, a joke. Like it's kind of like a throwback. It's like, hey, hey, I know about the old stuff too. So, <clears throat> excuse me. That's one way. The super wide, super constant vibrato. Some modern cats still have a strong vibrato. Jesse Davis. Awesome. I actually am not familiar with Jesse Davis. So good to know. I'll have to check him out. Or her. Is it a, is it a guy or a girl? Jesse Davis. Or is it neither? Or both? Let me know. Um, Jesse Davis. Okay, so we got a, a player who's more modern, uses that wide vibrato. The main way that jazz players use vibrato from like the 1940s on is what I call terminal vibrato. And that's a term, terminal like dying, like terminal cancer. Uh, if something is terminal, it's happening at the end. So a lot of players from 40s, 50s, 60s, they'll start a note straight and then See, guy plays in small sometimes. Okay. I'll have to be on the lookout for Jesse Davis. Terminal vibrato is when you play a note. But as you're coming to end the note, you increase the vibrato. And this was something that um, this term came from a great educator that was at UNT 
when I was there. I don't know where he got it, but he put me onto this term, John Murphy, who is now uh, no longer with us, but was a genius. And that term, terminal vibrato, I think comes from, or not that term, but that technique, I think comes from vocalists more than anything. If you listen to singers like Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Sarah Vaughan, Nancy Wilson, you get that sort of like, they'll sing a note and toward the end it has vibrato. And we can do that same effect on the saxophone. And it's usually coupled with a fade out. So like the note is getting softer as the vibrato is increasing until the sound stops entirely. So if I'm gonna play body and soul, and this is kind of toward the end of a phrase too. So long notes. That's an example of terminal vibrato. And you can play around too with straight tone, no vibrato, all vibrato all the time, terminal vibrato. And uh, I would say a great example, this is Dexter Gordon. Check out Dexter Gordon, the way that he plays a melody. It's like such a beautiful and there's so much character. The way that he uses vibrato, the way that he uses straight tone, when he chooses to use those things dynamically, uh, whether a note is loud or soft or increasing in volume or decreasing in volume, all those techniques can combine to build, you know, your, your unique jazz style. And if you're going for a certain thing, uh, I think it's good. Excuse me, I got a caffeinate. It's mandatory. <clears throat> I think it's good to know all the ways that people have implemented vibrato and when it is and when it is not most appropriate. So like I said, playing old school, you're gonna have more vibrato. Playing more modern stuff, you might not have vibrato at all. If you wanna cop like a Dexter kind of mentality, you might alternate and be pretty fluid about when you use it, when you don't. Those are my two cents on vibrato. Let's see, love Jesse Davis, got a few of his recordings. Strong cannonball influence on him. Sick. Next topic. This is also from Eric. Eric kind of crushed it with uh, the response here. Instrument hygiene. This is something I think isn't really taught enough at the beginning. And so a lot of cats end up having leaks and instruments that are in disrepair all the time because it's just not something that you practice. But I, I'm kind of obsessive about it. And I always use, I have, a, I have a swab. I have like a large swab. These are made by Yamaha. They're kind of overpriced. And honestly, if you're good at like sewing or tying knots, you can make your own pretty easily. So there's like a big one for the body of the horn and it has like a weight. Put it through the bell. I can even show you. I'm gonna take off my neck, but first, mouthpiece cap. Protect my <laughs> costly Legere reed. All right, so swabbing the instrument. I'm just gonna demonstrate, I guess, my clean my cleaning process, all right? It's very basic, but people don't really talk about it. So I'm always holding my horn by the bell when I'm doing this. This is the most secure way to hold the horn without you know, getting caught on any keys or anything. Drop the weight into the bell, kind of feed that string down in there, let it fall out the neck hole. I don't actually know what you call that part. I'm educated, but not like that. And pull it through and you'll kind of see if it's bringing moisture out with it. Reason you would pull it through in reverse like this is to draw that moisture out against the flow that it went in. And I reach my finger inside and kind of see, is it still moist in there? If not, there's no moisture, no condensation. We're good on that, right? I take the smaller swab. And under all the keys, it's kind of hard to do this 
standing. But under all the keys that stay closed, I start with the C-sharp key, put the cloth underneath the tone hole, and then just kind of pull it out, giving it a little motion as it comes out. And if there's any moisture on there, it'll help suck up some of that moisture. So I go through, I clean the low C-sharp key, I clean the low E-flat key, which also gets messy, and you kind of got to feed the, the cleaning cloth through a little bit. It's a little bit tricky to get under there. I kind of put it around, put it underneath the little arm of the key, and try to get down there at the bottom of it because that's where a lot of moisture accumulates. And if this thing, if you don't clean underneath that E flat key, it gets really gross, especially if you are want to uh, not be able to rinse your mouth out or brush your teeth before playing after eating. It's another thing you should not do if you can avoid it. So side F sharp key would be next. It's not really much moisture coming out. I've only been playing for about an hour today. The G sharp key here, you want to get under there. I like to just kind of, it's hard to get under there, but like kind of force the cloth under a little bit and get it under there. And then uh, you got the side B flat, you got the side C, or really it's an A sharp key. And then the palm keys and then the high F key. And if you have a high F sharp key, you would do it under there too. I'm not gonna demonstrate all that, but moisture accumulates pretty easily under the palm keys as well. So I clean the body out with a large swab and then I take a small cloth, I clean under all the keys that stay closed. Then, Tom out, <clears throat> cleaning the neck, the mouthpiece. Since I use a plastic reed, I also have a cloth just for wiping off the reed. So I use a microfiber cloth. This is very nerdy. So thank you all for staying tuned. I have one microfiber cloth that I use to wipe off the reed. So there's all kinds of minerals and stuff that come out of the mouth that uh, might get in the way of a perfect seal against the mouthpiece. So I just wipe the reed off. Another advantage of the plastic reed. And then I'll take my small swab and run it through the mouthpiece kind of back and forth a few times. Try to get most of the moisture out of the mouthpiece. Again, minerals from the mouth, like you can see on the sides of my mouthpiece, it's kind of starting to turn white. It's because there are, are minerals in our saliva that will start to build up and occasionally you'll want to clean that stuff off, which you can do with like diluted lemon juice, which I don't have with me today. You can also use toothpaste, I have heard, but I always use lemon juice. The neck, clean the neck, swab goes in. Same thing I did with the mouthpiece. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit, about three times usually. And then feel for any moisture. If there's still any moisture, you do it some more. There's no moisture now. So now you get to see me reassemble my horn. <clears throat> I always start with the neck and I always have cork grease. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of cork grease, just like a light layer. If you put a little bit of cork grease on the neck every time you put your horn together, it's actually gonna make the cork kind of cure. And you can see the cork on my instrument is actually kind of slick and shiny. Always put the mouthpiece on, no reed, no ligature. I'm gonna do like a little twisting motion like this. And eventually where you're, if you tune it, you're gonna find kind of a groove where the mouthpiece sits and the instrument plays in tune. So that's where my groove is. Depending on temperature, you know, you might have to adjust. Depending on intonation, if you're playing with a, you know, some kind of different kind of ensemble, you might need to adjust. 
but you can find an approximate, like always in tune kind of position and it'll leave that mark there. It's almost like an indentation. Now, I don't put the reed on until the mouthpiece is on the neck because if you're just fiddling with the mouthpiece, it's small, uh, especially if you have big hands like I do. I tend to drop things. <laughs> so for my safety and the safety of my mouthpiece and my instrument, you know, I always put the mouthpiece on the neck first. Then this is going to be kind of gross, but I lick the table of the mouthpiece. So I'm going to, I'm moistening the table. I'll put the ligature on. And then only after the ligature is on, do I put the reed on. I'm going to lick the back of the reed too. The reason for that is because if you put the ligature on after you put the reed on, you risk chipping the, the tip of the reed with the ligature. And when I got the reed on, I want to check by pressing the reed against the mouthpiece. I don't know if you can see. There are three rails on the mouthpiece. There's two side rails and then the tip rail. You want it to be even between the side rails. You want the tip of the reed to touch somewhere in the middle of the tip rail. It's a very fine adjustment, but if you get it right, it's going to make the instrument way more responsive. Now, this ligature has screws on the side. <clears throat> And since I am holding the neck, I have a little more leverage. So I'm actually holding the, the little screw and turning the neck. I'm not turning the screw. I don't think I can really get enough strength out of my little, you know, my, my finger and my thumb to really get it tight. And that's going to give you a really tight seal. And you're not going to damage your reed or your mouthpiece in the process. All right, now, I did not talk about polishing, but I have a separate cloth for polishing. And I usually, especially the more, the areas with more hand contact where you might get oil on the horn, I think it's important to, uh, <clears throat> to give it a good polish because otherwise, again, like the, the pH levels of your, of your of your sweat and the oils on your skin don't really have a good interaction with the keys so anywhere where you might be touching it palm keys side keys uh, if you don't have like inlays on those keys then um, you can save them protect your instrument and Impress your technician when you bring your horn in. They can be like, oh, wow, you take care of it. <clears throat> Most people don't. That's my take on instrument hygiene. That's my process. Highly recommend. Oh, also, this is a cap for the, the neck. I always put it in the, the instrument to store it. Just sort of keeps it from any unwanted damage. Been out of shape. All right, let's see. If you've always been playing for a few hours, you can dump the collection of water out. Yes, sir. So that's something that happens too. You always, it's almost like clearing out the spit valve on a trumpet. You just, uh, one, the one exception really where I'm not holding the bell, I'll hold the body like here ish, dump it out like that. Okay. <clears throat> The next topic comes from Luke Wynn, talking about blend. Luke wrote to me and said that he's been playing in a classical wind symphony. <clears throat> and blend is extremely important in that setting. It's also extremely important in general. And one thing... I tell my private lesson students, as fun as it is, like if you're playing along to a bird record or a Dexter record or whatever, Sonny, well, either Sonny, <clears throat> it is tempting to want to play 
with a full volume, full sound the whole time. But what I always recommend as a practice when you're transcribing music to imagine that the, the record, imagine that the lead part that you're learning is the lead player in a section and you're playing second to them. Or you're maybe, if they're the lead alto, you're playing second tenor or something. Imagine that that record, whether it's, you know, a Sonny Rollins solo or whatever, that that is the leader of the band and you should be a little bit underneath it. The temptation is to match it or play above it, especially people transcribing in headphones. But you'll get way more out of it if you drop your volume and try to blend as if you're a section player and the solo you're transcribing is the lead player. <clears throat> you'll also catch a lot more of the articulation. You'll catch a lot more of the style. Like I mentioned, vibrato, dynamics, all that stuff becomes way easier to hear when you play just a little bit softer. And then if you're, you know, if you're wailing, shredding later at the gig, fine. But if you're playing in a section, you're playing under a lead, you can practice that process by playing under the solo that you're transcribing or under the record that you're playing along to. My thoughts on that. I don't do a lot of classical playing. I do play in a chamber ensemble pretty regularly, uh, but my role in that ensemble is not necessarily a section player because it's so small. Um, and blending with other instruments is also crucial. So we play with a woodwind section and a string section. The string section is pretty small. So it's difficult, it's, it's really challenging. Practicing playing under records helps you when you go into a setting where you're playing under an instrument that really can't play too much louder. So if I'm trying to match with a violin who's on the other side of the stage, that practice of playing transcriptions where you're matching underneath becomes like super valuable. So playing soft, playing when you practice, practicing playing soft, practicing playing softer than the record that you're learning from, all that has real life applications and it's just going to improve your playing and it's going to improve your the variety that you can apply when you're working. Let's see what else. Overtones and long tones. All right, we're getting into some, some gritty stuff. <clears throat> My take on overtones and and they mentioned uh the rasher the sigurd rasher book if you're not familiar there's a book that was written by a great classical saxophone player named sigurd rasher the basic practice of overtones you should start with low b flat low b flat is the sound of the entire tube of the instrument <laughs> playing full breaths of low B flat. Imagine that your jaw is opening as wide as possible while still keeping the embouchure firm around the mouthpiece. And the embouchure shape, a lot of people say it should be a circle, but look at the mouthpiece. It's not a circle. It's flat at the bottom and it's curved at the top. So your embouchure shape really should be more like a, like a, like a D on its side, if that makes sense. Um, so it's really like, more of a uh, like half circle kind of shape than it is a full like circular round shape uh, and playing that low B flat imagine opening the jaw using the muscles of the embouchure to support the sound and listen and try to draw out as many of the overtones of that low B flat as possible you should be able to hear third above fifth above tritone above all that. So I'm going to play a low B flat and I'm going to try to expand the sound as much as possible, bringing out as much of the richness of the overtones as I can. So check this out. You hear like that. You hear that. Then I 
isolating the different partials. So I'm going to finger a little B flat, but I'm going to sound the B flat above that. <laughs> That in and of itself, holding the first overtone with the low fingering is going to get you pretty far in building your tone and building your, your accuracy and in intonation. Then you'd move to the next overtone. That's my F over low B flat fingering. Then the next overtone is a high B flat. Then high D, which would be normally finger with the palm D. Then high F. Then altissimo, A flat. Still fingering low B flat. Then high B flat. You could go higher than that if you want. And I find that altissimo E is pretty much the highest pitch. Uh, you can also practice matching the regular fingering with the low B flat fingering. So if I'm playing a bis B flat here, no octave key, you can match that with the low B flat. And you can do that with any overtone off of any fundamental. Yeah, so those are the big, those are the big things with overtones for me. And they're hard. Uh, and it takes a long time to get used to doing it physically. But it starts, in my opinion, with getting a really solid handle on low B flat. Uh, what else here? Okay. This was a question that came from Lorenz in Hamburg. Uh, if you haven't checked out his channel, he's he's called Lorenz Hargassner, and uh, he's a great alto player in Hamburg, Germany. He plays in a group called Pure Desmond. Excellent player, really cool guy. I did a video on his channel recently. Actually, I think it was about six months ago. Anyway, his question was really about how to use scales to play over changes. Christoph, that's awesome. Uh, and this is related to P. Green's question about improvising to a song with many different chord changes. Uh, would writing out the initial improvisation help? <clears throat> I would say <clears throat> the first the first thing that you should do is learn the melody. If you don't know the melody, it's kind of pointless to learn the chord changes. Because even if you don't take a solo, as a saxophone player, a horn player in general, you are automatically the lead voice in the jazz combo. So whether you're playing with backing track or a duo or a trio, or you're playing a solo in a big band. If you know the melody, you can at least do that. That's foundational. So learn the melody. I recommend learning the melody at least two ways. The first thing would be to learn the stock arrangement, which is really like the real book. So if you can learn the real book version of the melody and internalize that here, excuse me, internalize that here and here, learn it by heart, boom. That's gonna help you in situations where you have cats who might not know all the tunes, but they have the real book. So learn the real book version. <clears throat> Secondly, learn the words and learn the words as they come from great singers from the jazz era. I wouldn't recommend learning the Jeff Goldblum version of a song, for example. Uh, <laughs> go back, go back to Ella, go back to Billy, uh, go back to Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra is a really great point of reference because everybody knows his recordings. 
learn those versions. And if you have software where you can transpose those vocal arrangements to the standard key, like let's say the song is in concert B flat, but the Ella Fitzgerald version, she's singing it in concert A flat. If you have software where you can change the pitch, uh, I use Transcribe from Seventh String Software. It's great. I've been using it forever. Uh, you can just bump the pitch up from A flat to B flat, and now suddenly you're in the standard key. You can learn to play Ella Fitzgerald in your key. <clears throat> so I would say start with the melody. Then, and really only then, uh, learn the chord changes. So let's say Autumn Leaves, for example, right? So I want to learn the, was it the autumn leaves drift past my window, the autumn leaves are red and gold. I admittedly don't know all the words to this song, but you know the tune, get the melody together first, then get the chord changes together. And it's weird because we don't, we can't play chords on the saxophone. All we can play is Hello Spirit. <laughs> All we can play on the saxophone is one pitch at a time. And, and there are some exceptions to that, obviously, but we're working with a monophonic instrument for the most part. So how do we play chords on the saxophone? And the, the basic thing is you can't. You have to imply the chords. So it's kind of a connect the dots thing. The last note that you played, <laughs> the human mind interprets that as being related to the next note. And if you play enough notes in a row with enough, uh, you know, with little enough time between them, we hear that as being a chord. So I'm gonna play uh, my A minor seven. So I just outlined a chord and you get the impression of A minor seven, but I'm not, I can't play an A minor seven. We're talking about autumn leaves. So the first chord is a concert C minor or A minor on the alto. First thing you need to be able to do is play that chord in at least one position. So I'm doing root position. I'm going one, three, five, seven of the chord. And then go through the whole tune that way. Approaching each chord the same way. So if I'm going one, three, five, seven on that chord, I'm gonna go one, three, five, seven on every chord of the tune. So the first one's A minor 7, then D7, then G major 7, then C major 7, and so on. Once you get that, then practice playing the chords full range, or as close to full range as you can. So if we're going... I think you need to be able to play the chord tones wherever they lie on the instrument. So once you have an understanding of the basic chord tones, then what I recommend is playing through the tune using nothing but the one, three, five, and seven, using nothing but roots, thirds, fifths, and sevenths of each chord and playing it as quarter notes. So I'll demonstrate with that tune. just playing notes that come from the root, third, fifth, and seventh of the chord. Then once you have a handle on that, improvise using just roots, thirds, fifths, and sevenths of each chord. This is gonna really burn into your mind and your, your hands. Like these are the basic go-to pitches of the chord progression. And you can improvise freely rhythmically. So if I'm doing autumn leaves, and 
thirds fifths and sevenths that's what i was just doing once you can improvise just using those chord tones <clears throat> then you know the melody you know the chord progression then it's time to start implementing scales licks other patterns vocabulary you might want to put into your playing <clears throat> i do think what was the name of the person who asked p green um so first learn the chord changes once you've learned the melody and learn the chord changes just how I described it. <clears throat> then we're talking about mm, writing out a solo. I would find a, a recording of it that sounds manageable for you. And one great, great resource for that I'm going to put this in a chat even. That's how strongly I feel about it. Is jazz standards.com. Uh, you can go to jazzstandards.com, type in any standard tune, search for it, and it'll give you a list of the various famous recordings or like the most iconic recordings of that song. That would be a good place to start. If you can find a version that has a solo that you feel like you can manageably transcribe, go for that. If not, next best thing would be find a solo transcription that someone else has done that already exists and learn that. I'm not big on if you're a beginner or intermediate player, and I don't know, uh, P. Green, I don't know if you are, you know, what level you are at in your ear training and, and transcription practice, but. If you're not an advanced player, it's super helpful to grab a transcription from someone else. Now note, not all transcriptions are created equal. So sometimes people's transcriptions are not accurate and you've got to just kind of trust. Um, like historically, I, I feel like mine are pretty accurate. I try to be super accurate with mine, but historically like the, the Omnibook, is not super accurate. You know, a lot of those books are not super accurate. So be careful. But I think finding a transcription is probably better than trying to compose a solo at first. But if you already have some experience with transcribing, you've already got some familiarity with jazz improvisation, go for writing your own solos. You don't have nothing to lose, basically. It is only going to help you to write out your own solos. And I would go so far as to say, like, writing out solos, writing your own etudes. This is where you can really start to build your own taste and your own style into your jazz playing, which is really what it's about. Like, we're not, I mean, I kind of sound like Bird, I kind of sound like Cannonball, but ultimately that's coming through me. And the more that I write things out, the more that I come up with my own patterns, my own ideas, and the more that I've learned things off records, the more that my style becomes my own. And this isn't something that is a short-term practice. It's something that's going to take you, you know, as long as you're playing your instrument, you will be cultivating your own style based on your own taste, based on the records that you've heard in your life that really make you feel something. You want to be able to bring that energy into your playing <clears throat> and writing your own music is a huge uh, component of that. So, yes, I highly recommend if you have the skills, definitely write out uh, choruses or, or maybe even two chorus, three chorus solos, depending on the tune. Michael Brecker, we all know and love Michael Brecker, hopefully, uh, 
went through a process for, I think, hundreds of days where he actually wrote out a new 12 bar blues melody every day. And um, I mean, we know how well he played the saxophone. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I'm going to move on. So next point, finger accuracy. Okay. I'm kind of weird. Uh, if you haven't noticed by my vibe, but I heard about this technique that a great classical saxophone player named Jean-Marie Londex came up with. I, I have dimes that I keep in my saxophone case right here. And what I do, or what I started with, was I play with practice in front of a mirror. If you're, you're welcome, P. Green. If you are practicing in front of a mirror and you notice, you'll notice, you'll really notice. Like if you try to play a scale, right? You notice, especially like fingers will come off the keys when you're playing. Maybe not this far, but you know, you'll notice they come up. That's going to slow your technique down considerably. So if you want to play like up and down your scale super fast, any technique you want to do super fast, if your fingers are coming off the keys, that's time wasted that the finger has to go up way off the key and come back down. You want to avoid that. And the best way that I have found is this Jean-Marie Londex technique where you take a, a dime and basically place it between, you notice which fingers are coming up, and it's usually the ring finger. Take the dime, place it between the pad of the finger. So like put your hand on the saxophone like you're playing it, and then put the dime between the key touch and the fingertip. And then whatever technique you're trying to do, whether it's a major scale or, or what, play it with that coin in place and try not to drop it. And you'll notice it feels super awkward. As you develop the ability to play with one dime, add dimes. So then you put like a dime underneath both ring fingers. And you're going to hear me do this. And it might sound super weird. I'm playing a G major scale up and down. That's all it is. This forces your fingers to stay close to the, the keys, <clears throat> lest you drop the dime. Now, when your finger's not pressing the key down, it forces you to keep some amount of pressure between the fingertip and the key without actually pressing the key in at all. Super valuable practice. That's my take on, what was it? Finger accuracy, I think was the question in hand. Finger accuracy from Jean-Marie Londex. And that's spelled L-O-N-D-I-E-X. I'm gonna put it in here. Cause this guy was one of the great, I think he's, he's very old if he hasn't already passed uh, but he was one of the great classical players of the French school who really pushed the limits of what could be done on the saxophone. An incredible guy. Very eccentric, too. Interesting uh, approaches to saxophone. Next, Glenn W., we'll say. Uh, articulating at fast tempos. <sighs> that was the topic there. So articulating at fast tempos is really not too different from articulating at like medium tempos, except there's more information happening. I think the best place to start with this probably is Sonny Stitt. Really digging into his soloing, but not for the sake of playing it, you know, playing the pitches and rhythms, which we are kind of obsessed with pitches and rhythms in jazz education and jazz transcription, but going about it with the intention of hearing the articulation. And if you followed me, um, yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, you can thank the French for that. 
if you follow me, you probably heard. I mean, that's the name of this channel is Saxophonetics, and that is really because I believe you can get pretty far with all of with these uh, sounds. So D, T, E, and N. D is going to be just a regular note, right? T is going to be an accented note. E is going to be a note that is was tied from the last note and is tied to the next note. N is going to be a note that is ghosted, which means regular attack, hard attack, no attack, and tongue is on the reed. I hope you all can see that. <clears throat> When you are listening to saxophone records, trying to transcribe the articulation, it helps to have software to slow it down. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, and I'll put this in the chat too, the software that I use is called Transcribe. And that you can get from, it's from Seventh String. I'm putting this in the chat. Um, that is great for slowing down music without distorting it. I don't know how they figured out how to do that, but you can slow it down pretty far without losing the quality of the recording. <clears throat> and it helps you to hear, if you're thinking this way, which notes are attacked, which notes are accented, which notes are slurred, and which notes are ghosted. And you can start to build this technique with just thinking, uh, but alternating between D and N articulations on a single pitch. And I've talked about this in previous videos, but this is the point. Uh, you'll be able to hear it. I'm going to go D, N, D, N, D, N, like you're saying, Indian. All right. So once you can hear that and execute that on a single pitch, then you can start applying that to moving lines. So going D N D N D N D N D N D N D N D, and from there, you can practice ghosting multiple notes at once. So if I want to tongue one note, for example, this is a very common technique. Tongue one note, ghost three notes. So I'm going to go. I'm gonna end on a ghost to now. Check it out. If you do it fast, like the original topic was articulating at fast tempo, you start to hear that the notes that are not ghosted really pop out. So I'm going. Attack one, ghost three. You can really hear it, right? It's like, din, 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 din. If you look, not look, if you listen closely, slow down some up-tempo playing, especially, let's see, Luke Winter, could you talk a bit about anatomy and ghost man notes? Big lower lips will find it easier to just use my tongue to push more inside tip against the reed to mute notes. Uh, one second, and I'll, I'll think about that. <clears throat> so, Sonny Stitt slowed way down. Sonny Stitt really demonstrates this technique, especially in his double timeline. So if you take a Sonny Stitt double timeline, Slow that thing down to like 35, 30, 25% using transcribe. Or um, I have students that have tried the amazing slowdowner with good results too. Uh, but I personally, I don't like using my phone and transcribe is on the computer. So I recommend it. The question in the chat right now from Luke, could you talk a bit about anatomy and ghost slash muted notes? I have a big lower lip, so I find it easier to just use my tongue to push more inside lip against the reed to mute notes. Hmm. I have pretty small lips. Um, 
so it's not really in my personal experience. But I'm trying to imagine. Like if you have more, if you have more tissue in the lower lip. I think it, I think the same principles apply. And I think just, you know, as someone with smaller lips, I do think about how much lip I'm, I'm putting on the reed, how much lip is going into the mouth. You really don't need all that much lip in on the teeth. You can get by with just a little bit or none. Uh, there are players that just use a double lip embouchure. If you've heard, um, a lot of people say Coltrane used a double lip embouchure. I haven't gone down that rabbit hole enough. Um, I know for a fact that uh, Wes, warm daddy Anderson, who played with Wynton Marsalis, I think he still does. Uh, I'm not up on him, but I know because I met him when I was in school. I know that he uses a double lip embouchure, like how an oboe player would. It might be good, and it, and Luke, if you were here earlier when I was talking about low B flat, a good practice might be this low B flat, playing a low B flat and trying to open the jaw as much as possible and keep the, the embouchure firm. So I'll demonstrate that again. <laughs> While you're playing the low B flat, you want to open the jaw and you want to have the jaw so loose that you can even move it from side to side without affecting the, the sound. So the sound is going to continue, but I'm going to be able to move my jaw around. Might be something to try. And I would also recommend, you know, trying, um, trying to push the limit so maybe take more lip take less lip see what works because a lot of this is physiological like i don't think coltrane had particularly small lips but he was still able to use the ghost note articulation you know so it's not like it's not like it's impossible but you've got to find what works for you and that's going to vary based on things like that, like how, uh, you know, where your jaw is positioned, the size of the lip, the amount of tissue, how soft, how firm that tissue is, um, you know, how like limber it is. Is it, is it firm? Is it stiff? Can you stretch it? Um, you know, it's, it's different for everyone, but I think the principle of what you want to get to is to where the ghost of note is achieved by having the tongue on the reed and not uh, adding pressure to the lower lip, at least as far as cats that I know uh, and cats that I've transcribed. <clears throat> That's kind of the effect. That's how you get that ghosted note effect. I hope that helps. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not really privy uh, from firsthand experience, but um, yeah, that's, that's the best explanation I can give for now. I have about 15 minutes before I want to go into like random uh, off the cuff questions. And I have a few questions here. Lorenz was asking, how do we use scales to play over changes? And not just like, okay, if I'm, I'm going to go back to autumn leaves because I think it's a good, everybody knows autumn leaves pretty much. A lot of people say like you should be able to play up the scale. So I'm going from the, the first note of the scale, going up the scale as long as I have time to do it, outlining this, you know, 2-5 to concert B flat, and then a 2-5 to concert G minor. Important exercise to do. Wow, I'm knocking my board around. Important exercise to do, for sure, whenever you're learning a tune. But it doesn't necessarily, you can't just 
you can't just be playing with a combo and do that on every chord change. So how do we uh, how do we implement scales? I think first you got to know the chords. Like I was saying earlier, you got to be able to outline the chords and then be able to improvise with just roots, thirds, fifths, and seventh of the chord. And even if you want, and I go do I do this, improvising with just triads. So one, three, five, even. That's going to really solidify that the sound of the the chord changes in your mind. So you've got to get that internalized. Then you've got to get the seventh chords internalized. Or I, I mean, it's arguable. I think learning the seventh chord outlines is most important. Triads are kind of secondary. Ninth chords are kind of secondary. Then get the scales together. So I'm using a, a Dorian. Then D Mixolydian. Then G Ionian. C Lydian. Then F Sharp uh, Locrian. Then I'm doing B, the fifth mode harmonic minor. Then E minor, E natural minor. So those would be the, the scales that most directly connect with the chords of Autumn Leaves. But how do we then use those scales to play actual lines that hit changes? I guess that's the ultimate question. <clears throat> and the best answer I can give for that is study cats that have done it and study the cats that uh, that did it, you know, that established the style. So if you're an alto player, I would start with Lou Donaldson. If you're a tenor player, I would start with, who would I start with? I mean, I would start honestly, probably with Lester Young. Um, check out like Lucky Thompson's playing. Uh, but you got to find solos that are simple enough, over simple enough tunes that you can grab ideas from them. And then you'll start to kind of develop a sense for it. So if I'm just using scales, it's really hard to connect. So you need a combination of scales and arpeggios and if you really internalize those arpeggios you will start to naturally get how those chord scales connect from one change to the next an important point <clears throat> thirds of the chords really indicate the color of the chord more than anything else uh ninths also help Thirteenths help to an extent, depending on the chord. But if you can come up with lines or grab some lines from <clears throat> classic jazz records where players are using scales to hit chord changes, you'll start to find ways that they connect. The more that you repeat those things, the more they become a part of your playing and the more natural it becomes. There's not a shortcut here. All I would recommend is repetition, finding lines that, that do use scales, composing lines, like I said earlier, where you are hitting the third of the chord on the beat where the chord hits. So in this case, like if I want to play into that uh, was my D7 chord. <laughs> and I want to make sure that that F sharp is in there when that change is happening, that's my priority. So if I'm doing a 2-5 there, hitting the, the third, if not right when the chord hits, at some point while the chord is happening. And as you learn techniques, you'll start to learn, you know, like the bebop scales, you start to learn chromatic passing tones. You start to learn enclosures. Um, I have yet to really get into that stuff on this channel, but it is something that uh, I can and do teach. 
it's not really something that I've, you know, I haven't gone through rigorously and practiced approaching every note of a quarter, every note of a scale using enclosures, but that, that technique is really powerful and it's everywhere. Like once you start, once you become aware that enclosures are just like a part of the jazz language, you start to see like, oh, that's kind of why that sounds that way. Cause you have these chromatic passing tones. They aren't really in the key, but they make it really hip. And <clears throat> I mean, that starts with the bebop scales. I'm not going to get into it now, but the basics of the bebop scales is a, uh, the major bebop. So in this case, if we're in the key of concert B flat, my G, that's going to be a G major scale. But we're going to slide the um, the sharp five or the flat six in between the fifth scale degree and the sixth scale degree. So that would be the first bebop scale to learn. The second one would be the mixolydian bebop scale or the Dominant bebop scale. Start with the mixolydian. And then we're going to add a half step between the flat seventh and the, the eighth or the next D. So it's going to be flat seven, major seven, one of the chord, root of the chord. And note, I'm demonstrating this without any articulation for the sake of uh, just showing you the scale. But if we were doing articulation, it, you know, <clears throat> there it is. So chromaticism is a huge part of jazz playing. Get the melody, get the chord changes, be able to improvise using just the chord tones, then learn the chord scales as they relate to the chord tones, as they relate to the chords and the progression then learn solos. I mean, it's a long process. There's no shortcut, like I said. But you're going to naturally, as you study more tunes and more solos and write your own vocabulary, you will start to develop sort of an instinct or you'll, you'll sort of ingrain fingerings and sounds into your hands and your ear to communicate different harmonic changes. We had a question from Ario in the email about Steve Grossman articulation. And um, Steve Grossman is not a player that I've studied directly, <clears throat> but he sent me some records to check out. Dant, for sure. Um, and Steve Grossman, really, if you study enough Parker articulation and enough Sonny Rollins articulation, I would argue that you can basically get to Steve Grossman <clears throat> just by those things. So I think it's important to, as far back as you can go, the question was basically, how, does, how do you cop Steve Grossman's articulation If you can't hear it in his playing, who his influences are, do some research. But I would always go back as far as you can. I imagine Steve Grossman was a huge uh, fan of Sonny Rollins and a huge fan of John Coltrane and a huge fan of Charlie Parker. If I was going to think, I mean, I don't know much about Steve Grossman personally, but listening to his music, if you wanted to cop his articulation, if you cop the articulation of those three players, Train, Sonny Rollins, Charlie Parker, you would be able to execute any articulation technique that Steve Grossman used in his playing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Talking too much. I'm losing my voice. More coffee. Thanks for your patience. Um, let's see. Alternating ghost note with standard articulation. This is another question from an email I got. Um, <clears throat> and the question was really about positioning. So there really isn't a way to alternate between the saxophone mouthpiece being straight in the mouth like you're playing classically and 
jazz where your the mouthpiece is a little bit off center or your tongue is hitting the reed a little off center to get that mm. I personally can't do it where it's like everything's right down the middle and you're still able to achieve the same like ghosting effect that Parker or you know any of these cats I'm talking about do um, and I don't personally I wouldn't really see the point um, but I understand the question. I think as I've talked in, in my early videos on this channel, jazz players often will keep their mouthpiece at a slight angle or play their instrument off to the side. Like Parker always played with his instrument slightly off to the side <clears throat> and they don't really change from that. So if you are trying to do that, I would stop. I would try to find a comfortable position for you where you can do ghost note articulation and then also uh, study separately classical techniques and the, you know, the, the great origins of, of virtuosic saxophone playing. Like if you can get into some Marcel Mule, uh, Sigurd Rascher, like I mentioned earlier, Jean-Marie Landex, those cats, it's really important to know the uh, proper technique, but I think that <clears throat> executing those techniques with uh, the instrument kind of at an angle so you can also ghost. Uh, I hope that answers that question. I don't know if um, Ario is in this chat right now. It's looking like there's not a ton of people in here, but probably a lot of people will hit the replay. The last thing, actually there's two things. One of them, uh, someone named Rad C emailed me about, he would want to hear my approach to improvising over Bluesette. Bluesette is not really a tune I'm familiar with, but I looked it over a little bit uh, and it's in three. It's in the key of B flat and it's kind of a, it's like, how's it go? <laughs> I actually don't even remember how it goes. Mm, something like that. Um, changes are pretty standard on that tune. The only weird thing, it's not even weird, it says in 3-4. tune very well but it, it brings up a couple things and i'm gonna open this up for for you know whatever questions you may have here in a second but <clears throat> learning tunes and learning chord progressions i think is crucial and there are a few tunes that you need to learn as a jazz player and it's valuable to study playing over those chord progressions in every key there's basically Four of them. The first one is I Got Rhythm. You should learn I Got Rhythm at least in the key of concert B flat, which for me is G, and be able to outline the chords pretty clearly on that chord progression. The second tune is 
Cherokee. <clears throat> now, if you know Cherokee, you can play Bluesette because the, <laughs> the beginning of, of Bluesette is kind of the beginning of the chord progression of Cherokee in a certain way. And then the end of the form as it goes through that, um, like, is kind of out of Cherokee. If you learn Cherokee in every key, which I know sounds crazy, but if you if you work out that chord progression in every key on your instrument, you can play, I don't know, like 90% of jazz standards. If you learn I Got Rhythm in every key, that pretty much covers all the traditional standards. And then the other tunes that I recommend learning in every key, I guess there's three more. Uh, if you want to play a traditional style, all the things you are, if you learn all the things you are in every key, you will level up like crazy. If you learn a Charlie Parker blues in every key, you will also become a monster. So those, are, I guess, are the main four. The other progression I'd recommend shedding in every key is giant steps. And with these, I mean, it's not like you're going to, I mean, I don't know. I heard that Charlie Parker did practice lines over Cherokee in every key. I don't know if that's just myth. Um, so it's a great practice, but don't think of it as like, oh, I have to be able to play rhythm changes at 320 beats per minute in every key. It's more about expanding your your connection to from your ear relatively to each of the keys. So it's not like like 99.99% .99 of the time, unless you're playing with a vocalist, you are going to be playing I Got Rhythm in concert B-flat. So there's not a whole lot of use for being able to play I Got Rhythm at, you know, 320 beats per minute in every key. Although it would be sick and super badass if you did that. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to be able to at least get through these, these chord progressions in every key. And I've done a fair share of study on it. It's not necessarily something that will stick with you permanently, but if you add it to your practice routine, you will see massive results in a very short span of time. At first it sucks though, but I would start with Cherokee, honestly. Um, if you're going to learn a progression in every key, uh, there was one other question from Nayland. Ear training. <clears throat> Again, you know, if you learn enough tunes, enough chord progressions, you'll start to build an internal sense. But the the other um, the other crucial thing is get away from the horn. If you have a keyboard play piano. If you have a guitar, play guitar, because that's a better way to hear the chords. On saxophone, like I said, all we can do is one pitch at a time. But if you have a chordal instrument, you can really hear those harmonies and you can hear the extensions. So if you're playing a D7 flat nine, it's like, yeah, you can communicate D7 flat nine, but if you can play all five of those notes at once, you get a better sense. The other thing would be singing. So singing scales, using solfege, using movable do, uh, meaning like if I sing, if I'm in the key of F concert, I'm singing do re mi fa so la ti do ti la so fa mi re do, internalizing that, and then internalizing minor scales. So if we're thinking we're in the Dorian mode, do re me fa so la te do te la so fa me re do. That's a little off pitch, but I'd recommend doing that not just with scales, but also with licks. If you can start mastering solfagio and connecting scale degrees with the syllables of the solfagio when you're learning licks, uh, melodies, scales, patterns, it's really going to create an internal sense where you are 
adding multiple layers to your understanding and your skills. So I think I'm going to leave on this point, and then I'm going to add, I'm going to let you all put any questions you may have in the chat and try to get through them. I'm going to close up here at 4 p.m. Eastern, so we got about 25 minutes left. <clears throat> but um, I think of musical ability. I, I'm not like a prodigy. I don't have like natural talent. It's not like um, I. You know, I wasn't born and then like I went to the piano and was like making music. It was like, it was kind of work for me. It was a lot of work for me. And I'm not saying that people who gravitate toward musical instruments uh, when they're toddlers, like it's not work for them. I think that the, the main thing is as musicians, we've been given this gift that is an interest in music. And it's on us as individuals and collectively to take that offering from the universe, whatever you want to call it, and then cultivate it. It's almost like uh, if you are a musician, you are handed, like nature is like, here's this big, uh, you know, raw gem. It's like a big rock of uh, whatever, like gemstone. That doesn't automatically make you a good musician. We have to find ways to cut it and, and shape it and make it into something beautiful. Take that initial interest, that initial, you know, calling toward music and then refine it. And that's a lifelong process. But it is easier the more ways that you have to think about it. Solfege is a great way to increase your ability. And the more that you have, it's almost like um, it's almost like a lattice work. It's like, okay, here's outlining chord changes. Here's solfeggio. Here's memorizing the lyrics. And where these things all come together into this one structure, you are able to learn faster. You're able to hear things and respond in real time faster, which really is the goal uh, in improvisation and jazz playing, to be able to communicate in real time. So... I hope that made sense. I'm gonna check out the chat and see if there's any new questions. Um, Moritz, thank you for all the videos you made on ghosting. So good to understand how it's produced and used. Great lesson today. Thank you, Moritz, for being on the call. Um, that it also, Nayland, you are here. That it also, some of the things I'm working on, especially the piano, solfege, and rough singing. Yes, uh, singing, I mean, I think we're all kind of born singers, musicians at least in some way, but it's a whole other set of skills, man. And you, you've, got to, you've got to practice that stuff kind of um, with a lot of patience because it's not as easy as just pressing down a key. It's like, this is G. Three fingers down on the left hand, G. It's like the pitch can kind of get away from you. You know, your your ability to recall and outlining chords even is like, do, me, so, me, do. It's like, I had to really kind of struggle to do that, you know, <clears throat> just now. So it's a thing, but that... Combined with like thinking numerically, so one, three, five, three, one, and then writing things out, looking at them on the staff, looking at things numerically on the staff. Uh, there's just a million ways to improve. How can I practice improv using chromatic scale? Um, practice improv using chromatic scale. Well, the chromatic scale is not necessarily something that you can just apply everywhere. If you think about it, it's like it's sort of like a whole tone scale. So the whole tone scale, and I'll demonstrate this real quick. I'm going to play my D whole tone scale. This is a concert F whole tone scale. <laughs> Mm 
Now, if you put a chromatic passing tone between each degree of that scale, you get a chromatic scale. It's not really practical, uh, but there are instances where pieces of the chromatic scale really work. And who is this asked? Um, Blue, Blue Kingdom. Okay. So a good example. Here's one that comes up a lot in Charlie Parker and traditional bebop playing. I'm going. It's all chromatic. But like, for example. The first part of that is the chromatic scale. It's a triplet. And then it's more, you know, chord tones. So there are chromatic passing tones between the major seventh and the ninth of that shape. So that would be a B flat major seven outline. There it is there. I think it's good to know the chromatic scale because that stuff does come up a lot. But it's not like... You can't always just be like playing a solo and use chromatic scale, like in the same way that you can be, like it's not as versatile as like a blues scale, for example. Um, like if you're playing a, a blues scale, you can hit like, you know, an entire form with a blues scale if you want. So I'm playing autumn leaves. <laughs> blues scale vocabulary and then on the minor it's more versatile but i would say like the blues scale the chromatic scale if you just play it up and down it's not as like it's not something you can use in every circumstance but there are a lot of circumstances where you can use part of it pretty much in any circumstance. Uh, a big one is that like triplet between the major seventh and the ninth of a chord. Another one is like between the flat third and the root of a chord. So if you're, or if however you want to think about it. So I'm going like, um, let's say I'm playing uh, like lullaby of Birdland, right? You could go over that F minor sound. And you'll find that in like early jazz playing more than modern jazz playing. But it is there. Uh, the chromatic scale kind of lets us have some enclosure techniques that aren't found in typical diatonic music. But um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's like you're gonna use segments of the chromatic scale in jazz playing, but you generally don't have lines where you're just gonna rip like an entire chorus of chromatic scale in eighth notes. It ends up sounding like a whole tone scale. It ends up sounding very um, like synthetic. <clears throat> I hope that answers your question, Blue. Um, does anybody have any other questions they want to put in the chat? Let me know, chat. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to hang out. So <laughs> if you want to hang with me while I finish this coffee, that's up to you. You're welcome, Blue. Oh, I do want to mention... If you want to take lessons with me one-on-one, uh, -on -one, this is you can email me here, the saxophone nyc at gmail.com. That's the email that I use specifically for private lesson students. So if you're interested, um, that's how you get at me. I am available for in-person sessions in 
New York or over Zoom or FaceTime or whatever if you're remote. And uh, what I what I usually do with private lessons is I'll have like one initial consultation. We can talk about what you want to learn uh, and see if you'd be a good fit for me and vice versa. Uh, and then we can negotiate a rate. I'm not, I'm not the cheapest uh, private lessons teacher, but I'm also not, I'm not expensive, you know, like I'm not difficult to hunt down either. Like if you want to take lessons from Chris Potter, he's going to probably charge you a lot more money than I would. And also he's probably not going to be available. So <clears throat> I am taking new students right now. If you want to study with me, I'm not trying to like do all sales pitch stuff, but you can email me here if you want to uh, have a call with me about lessons. <clears throat> Does anybody have any other questions? I'm going to try to uh, rip over Bluesette in the meantime. <laughs> I can't remember that tune. Eric Fairfax, why do you think it's so easy to hum or sing a melody or song with our voices, but when we grab our horn to play it, there is a huge disconnect. It's damn difficult to play what you hear in your head. Huh. Right? That's very true. Um, man, I think... Part of it is like we aren't born with a saxophone in our hands. You know, one of the first things that we do in life is cry. And then uh, after that, we learn to manipulate our parents' emotions using our voice. So we learn very early as humans what sort of affect we need to put on the voice to be able to get our needs met from our guardians, our caretakers, our providers. And, you know, the saxophone is like this external thing. We have to work. All right, Moritz. Thanks for tuning in. Saxophone, we have to work because it's an external thing, but I think, you know, it gets easier the more you do it. And one thing that I found super helpful, like, because playing in New York, if you're playing for a general audience, like if you're street performing, especially, you have got to play pop songs if you want to make any bread or any waves or get people's attention and hold it. I have found that like learning pop songs creates a connection with the instrument that you don't really have if you're learning uh, jazz standards in the same way. Christmas songs are also really great for this because we're all kind of, we grow up hearing it. We hear it everywhere. Um, Flashcards or some other. <clears throat> Real quick, I guess... The, the main thing I think that, that closes that gap between what you hear and what comes out of the horn, at least my experience, is repetition for one, but also learning lyrics. But mainly it's learning melodies or licks or pieces of melodies in every key and thinking of it as numbers. So for me... If I'm like, I'm gonna try to write this where y'all can see it. So if I'm gonna, if I'm taking a shape, right? Like, let's say my shape is four eighth notes. I'm thinking one, two, three, five. Super common shape. Uh, I want to think one, two, three, five. I also want to think do. 
re, mi, so, or sol, depending on what country you're in. <clears throat> so if you go do, re, mi, so, one, two, three, five, and then take that idea and play it in one key. I'm going to play it in D on my horn. And then practice playing that through all the keys. You get an internal sense of one, two, three, five whenever you hear it. So the best place to start, in my opinion, is moving ideas around in fourths. like Christmas tunes, especially, um, you can get those in every key. Just taking that fragment of the melody. Yes. Sigh. Yes. Uh, don't forget triads. Lyrics, very important. Uh, so I'm thinking, so... Mi, fa, so, do. Five, three, four, five, one. I'm also thinking Frosty the Snowman. Uh, and I'm also thinking this is a D major chord. Now, if you want to translate that to every key or transpose it. It becomes easier that way. We made it around the circle of fourths. You can also do this, you know, chromatically. so on. Um, the simpler the shape, the better to get started. Um, I, <clears throat> yes, Cherokee, I Got Rhythm, Bird Blues, Autumn Leaves. Uh, so I don't know if you were tuning in earlier, but I would also add to that all the things you are and giant steps. <clears throat> um, yeah, man, I'm Eric. I mean, I guess it's like it's just repetition, but it's also the mental exercise of like doing it and thinking about it like as many ways as you can. So one, two, three, five, you could also think of it literally, you know, like if I'm playing in the key of F, D, E. F sharp A, that'd be F concert, but my D. Um, you could also think of it like, you know, in every key, you could write out every key. So you think of it in D, you could also think of it in G, A, B, D, C, D, E, G. I don't know, I hope y'all can see that. Um, but yeah, like as many ways as you can think of it, the easier it will become and the shorter the distance between what you hear and what comes out of the horn becomes. Um, uh, what was the question that just came up? Do you have a recommended process to learn all the chords? Flashcards would be a great tool. Yeah. Um, I would learn them on the piano for sure. If you play piano at all, um, piano is great. If you play guitar, learn them on guitar. Um, you could learn them with the same process as this. So let's say you want to get all your major seventh chord outlines. <clears throat> Start with root position. So we're going to go one major third, fifth major seventh, right? Thank you, Cy. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so let's say we start with F major seven or my D major seven. 
You can learn it just like that. So you could do it full range, hitting every D, F sharp, A, C sharp, and D for the full range of the horn. And I'm going to go all the way up to uh, high F sharp and back down. So that would be one way. You could do that with all the, the chords. So if that's F major seven, concert F major seven, my D major seven. They move to concert B flat or G. Then C. And so on through the whole cycle. Went down a little further. Okay, E flat. And so on. Uh, another great way to learn the chords is to learn them in every inversion. So if you want to do um, your major seventh chords, you could go three, five, major seven, one. And then do that through all of the, uh, you know, the cycle. So start on my D, concert F. I'm going three, three, five, seven, one. And then move to uh, concert B flat, G. It will take time. I think writing about flashcards is a great idea. I'm, I totally encourage you to do that. Uh, practicing flashcards when you can't practice, practice when you can, practice and look at the flashcards at the same time, uh, as many ways as you can combine. Um, yes, you're welcome, Mario. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, reading comments, who's got something? Would you use that process for diminished, half diminished, augmented, et cetera? Yes, uh, I would definitely recommend it. But the most important thing is building repertoire. So learn these things as they relate to tunes. Uh, it's not as useful to learn them just kind of out of context. Although it is good for technique, remember like it's more important to have real life use for the things that you practice because time is short. Unless you have like six hours a day to sit in a practice room, I would focus on the chords that are in the tune or the tunes that you're working on at any given moment. So if you know you're going to play with some cats on Friday and you know that they're going to call out of nowhere, shed the chords to out of nowhere. Don't just shed chords to shed chords. Uh, you know, get get tunes that you know really well, tunes that you really want to play, tunes that you're going to be playing over on gigs, tunes that you're going to be playing over with your friends, whatever it is. Start there. <clears throat> and then if you have time, if you're like in music school or, you know, you're retired or something uh, and you have time to really shed everything, do that. But I would start with learning the chords to the tunes that you're trying to master, or at least have fluency improvising over those tunes. Uh, I hope that answers your question, P. Green. Can, Blue Kingdom, can you turn the shape into bebop or R&B? Yes. So. Really, I think bebop, the thing with bebop, let's say we have this one, two, three, five shape. You could enclose any of those notes. So lead into it. And then you could lead into it. So I'm going, I'm going from the flat seventh in the key. I'm going flat seven, major seven, two, flat two, one. 
We still are, are using that same one, two, three, five shape. And I'm articulating in a certain way. So I'm going D, D, N, D, N, D. So that'd be kind of like bebopifying it. You could even go. Mm. And you could think about enclosing all of those pitches the same way. really the effect of it is in enclosures and chromaticism and articulation. R and B, I think, you know, if you're playing that lick, that shape, you might have a different kind of uh, like way that you shade it. That might not be the best example of a an R and B lick, but let's say one of the things about R and B or smooth jazz playing is you have these turns that use the flat third a lot, the flat sixth a lot, the flat seventh a lot. So if we're playing like kind of vibe. I think though it's better to if you're gonna learn licks in a certain genre, grab from that genre. So if you want to get some smooth jazz ideas into your playing, check out the big, you know, the the popular smooth jazz players, Dave Cause, Kenny G. Um, there's more interesting players, Gerald Albright. Um, Grover Washington Jr., even uh, Stanley Turrentine, some of his stuff is really smooth. I would try to grab ideas from those those players and records like from those cats more than trying to take a, a bebop shape or a pentatonic shape or something and make it into an R&B line. It's much easier just to get it direct from the source and then kind of move that around. So something similar, you know. Um, you know, these kind of mannerisms. And if you really want to get to the heart of you know, playing smooth jazz or soul jazz or whatever you want to call it, there's no substitute for transcribing singers that are soul singers. So going back as far as like, I mean, some of my favorites are like Marvin Gaye. I've transcribed some Marvin Gaye, Bill Withers. Aretha Franklin, you know, really get into, if you want to play R&B saxophone, study R&B. It's, it's pretty simple. Like, I mean, that's like all I can suggest. If you want to get into, what was the other genre? If you want to get into bebop and you want to bebopify a pattern, study bebop players. I don't think there's as much... Um, like it's going to take you a lot of time and a lot of hassle to try to adapt a line to suit a genre that it isn't originally from. This is more of a mental and oral, meaning like ear training exercise, than it is uh, a style exercise. So that's all I really have to say about that. It is time for me to wrap up. I appreciate you all for being here. Um, if you are...
just reading the comments here. Thank you, Eric. Uh, the facts. Have a good day. Sai, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for your input. Thank you for your support. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, again, if you want to take lessons, you can email me here. If you want to join the email list, uh, check out the link in the bio here. I'll put it in the chat, too. Um, you'll be able to... See, be able to sign up for the email list there if you're not already on it. I'm going to try to do these maybe every month. So if you have any questions for me that you want me to address in a video, you can feel free to email me too, either here or jake at jakedester.com. But I got to go. I got other things I got to do today. I appreciate you all for being here. Um, Thank you for giving me your time and your attention and your support. And, uh, yeah, hope you all have a great rest of your Tuesday.